Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Ray Dubois, Senior Advisor here at CSIS. Uh, thank you very much for coming this morning. Stuart Bowen, the Special Inspector General for Iraqi Reconstruction, uh, published, what was that? Uh, published uh, hard lessons, uh, basically on the fifth anniversary of his appointment as the SIGR. Uh, I can remember when I was the Director of Administration and Management at the Pentagon, and Secretary Rumsfeld uh, asked me to assist in the establishment of his organization and how it would be resourced and how it would be uh, uh, populated, as it were. And uh, the negotiations, I will say, in a public forum with the State Department, USAID and OMB and the NSC were not without their hitches, uh, typical of this town when it comes to the interagency. And that is going to be, I hope, one of the focuses of our discussion uh, this morning. Uh, Secretary Rumsfeld, when he asked me uh, in January of 04, I no, January 04, uh, he called me into his office and he said, uh, this fellow Bowen's coming over to see me. What should I tell him? How did the negotiations go with state and, uh, and OMB and so forth? And I said, well, we've got it set up. He's going to have a temporary appointment. It's only going to last maybe six to ten months. Here we are five years later, another aspect of Washington that all of you uh, can appreciate. But I did say to the Secretary, well, when he comes in, boss, uh, ask him seriously, why did he take this job? It's an impossible job. And I understand from reading <laughs> hard lessons that that is uh, somewhat exactly similar to what he said <laughs> to, to Stewart. As I said in my invitation to you all, I hope that today's discussion is focused not so much on the mistakes and the finger pointing that have gone on in this town uh, uh, for the last several years with respect to Iraqi reconstruction and Iraqi economic development. Uh, although you cannot really understand where you want to go, where we ought to go, how the government at the federal level, the national level, and in the field ought to be organized to deal effectively with uh, contingency operations. And I will pause here for a moment. I understand from Stuart that the uh, White House will be announcing the new policy with respect to Afghanistan tomorrow and have a new moniker, Overseas Contingency Operations, OCO. And we might see a SIGR for OCO at some point in the future, which also might be a topic for this morning's discussion. But I hope that how we manage reconstruction activities in Afghanistan will benefit from what we have learned in Iraq. And certainly this book, Hard Lessons, uh, is uh, the, the seminal work, if you will, on those issues. And maybe not a bestseller on the New York Times bestselling list, but certainly uh, reminds me of those of us who took Economics 101 in college, Samuelson, kept coming out with additions and additions and additions, but it was a textbook, and this is somewhat of a textbook as a history, uh, that shall, and I believe, ought to be read by successive generations of folks in this town who deal with the interagency on reconstruction issues. Let me just take a few minutes and uh, quickly uh, tell you who is here. Stewart, of course, uh, five years ago was asked uh, by the President uh, initially uh, to be Inspector General for the CPA, the Coalition Provisional Authority, and then uh, 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 about eight, ten months later was uh, appointed officially as the Special Inspector General for Iraqi Reconstruction. Uh, he had been a partner at Patton Boggs here in Washington, prior to that Assistant Attorney General of the State of Texas, uh, but also had served for four years in the United States Air Force uh, as an intelligence officer. Um, Brad Penniston uh, is managing editor of Defense News, as many of you know. He's been 10 plus years as a defense journalist uh, in this town. He's authored two books on the Navy, uh, one of which uh, focused on the post-Cold War Navy. Uh, he is a student of Soviet and Eastern European studies uh, with a degree from Yale and has lived in Moscow for two years uh, and was a uh, 
stringer, if you will, for the journalistic world when he lived there. Rick Barton, my colleague here at CSIS, uh, well-known uh, uh, thinker, if you will, uh, on the issues of development assistance uh, as a senior advisor here and the co-coordinator, the co-director uh, of our post-conflict reconstruction project. Uh, Rick uh, most recently has uh, worked uh, as a member of the CSIS Commission on Smart Power, uh, also was the chair for the uh, for then uh, uh, candidate uh, Senator Obama uh, for the presidential subgroup on post-conflict reconstruction subsequent to the to the uh, election and was on the transition team at uh, uh, for developmental assistance. He's uh, been a lecturer and a professor at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton and was uh, in 1999, 2001, the Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees for the United Nations uh, in Geneva. Uh, I just want to take a minute here to remind all of us that the failures, and I've been public about this since I left the government, of the interagency uh, in many cases occurred more, in my view, here in Washington and less in the field. Stewart and his team, and I might add this team now five years later, is probably, not probably, is without a doubt a group, a critical mass, if you will, of individuals who understand the difficulties of interagency, interdepartmental, multidisciplinary contract contracting in a, in a contingency operation in the field. The future of the SIGR, I believe, will, will be with us in the sense that it may not be the SIGR for Iraq, but there will be something along these lines with whatever interagency entity is finally established by President Obama to deal with these issues. The recent National Defense Authorization Act, the so-called Duncan Hunter Act, uh, established uh, a law, the RSCMA, uh, which is supposed to give the State Department the final authority, the resources to deal with the interagency coordinating problems and challenges for economic development and reconstruction. In my estimation, that's step one, and we will probably talk about this some more in our discussion today. Uh, the New York Times referred to this book as a history of the American-led reconstruction in Iraq, which depicts, quote, an effort crippled before the invasion by Pentagon planners who were hostile to the idea of rebuilding a foreign country, and then molded into a $100 billion failure by bureaucratic turf wars spiraling violence and ignorance of the basic elements of Iraqi society and infrastructure. There were many individuals who, when this book came out, quite frankly, used them, used the uh, findings, the conclusions, the recommendations uh, for their own political purposes. I think that was a mistake. This book, I believe, is even-handed, and if you read it carefully, will give any of us who might have a role in going forward, be it with respect to Afghanistan reconstruction or with respect to ongoing contingency operations overseas, which, ladies and gentlemen, is not something that will stop, I believe. It is something that will continue, not, on the road, not in the same nature, if you will, of an Iraq or even of an Afghanistan, but it's going to present to the United States government and our allies ongoing challenges in, in these terms. Let me ask Stuart now to come up. He's going to address some of the key findings, conclusions, and recommendations. You're a sophisticated audience. We're going to stay away from the uh, Rotary Club in Boise, Idaho presentation, I hope. Uh, and then each of the three panelists, myself included, will make some remarks and pose a question to Stuart. Uh, and then the last 30 minutes, we'll take questions from the audience. Thank you.
Thanks, Ray, and thanks, Rotary Club members, for coming out this morning. <laughs> now, we're not going to do the PowerPoint. I'm just going to talk for 15 minutes about hard lessons, and uh, and then we'll hear from uh, Rick, who was who was uh, uh, and Ray partners of mine in in this effort from the start, and from Brad, uh, an obs a key close observer of this effort. Uh, and so, thanks, C CSIS, and thanks, Ray. And, and thanks, Rick, for, for really your support uh, for the last two years in, in producing what I think is a, is in a critical work in, in, uh, in informing how the United States reforms uh, contingency, overseas contingency operations, OCO. Uh, that is, that is uh, going to be the watchword moving forward in how we engage in Afghanistan and beyond, because there will be a beyond. Uh, since World War II, we've had many, many contingency operations. They have certainly defined uh, how the United States has uh, protected its interest abroad uh, in, in post-conflict situations. And the story of hard lessons, as, as, uh, as told in 350 excruciatingly detailed and footnoted pages, is, is one that reveals that the United States has not developed in those 40 years a structure to manage such operations. And Sigur and my team here, Ginger Cruz, my deputy, Vicki Butler, Chris Kirkhoff, my lead writers, thank you all for your support also as we, we produce this, this important effort. Our collective vision is that this would be a contribution to the, to the many voices that are calling for reform. And I heard them yesterday uh, on Capitol Hill. Uh, where my fellow Spectr Inspector, Special Inspector General Arnie Fields for Afghanistan here uh, and I testified exactly about this issue. And, and interestingly, the questions that I got from, uh, from the dais were, uh, is it even possible to reform, was one. Two, uh, why didn't we reform previously? <clears throat> and three, what's the way forward? Uh, is it possible? Of course it is. Uh, but the, the implicit question is, uh, who should undertake that reform? And that should be a, a, a combination of the Congress and the administration, of course. And the administration is going to speak uh, rather directly to, to the, the near-term goals with respect to managing the contingency in Afghanistan tomorrow. But the Congress has a larger mission, and that's to address the systemic flaws within managing contingency operations uh, that we have identified in hard lessons. Now, Mark Twain said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, it would be crazy to continue to approach contingency operations the way that we have over the last 10 years and, and prior there, too. Uh, hard lessons, 13 of them, actually, in Chapter 27. Uh, and, I, and I commend that chapter to you because it gives a good overview and, and really points the way forward. Uh, sp spells out both strategic and tactical solutions that the administration and Congress must engage. I've talked about the strategic one uh, uh, at length yesterday and briefly here, and that is the need for reforming the framework of how the United States approaches uh, uh, overseas contingency operations. And there are some solutions that have been presented already. This is, this is not occurring in a vacuum. The, the, the risk that uh, Ray referred to, the the Reconstruction Stabilization Civilian Management Act passed last October with almost no note. Uh, the, indeed, the, the, uh, the State Department personnel that we briefed on hard lessons were largely unaware of it, puts the responsibility for managing overseas contingency operations chiefly within the State Department's bailiwick. But it's simply an architecture without funding for building. Uh, and that, again, is another good idea uh, whose time has not yet come. On the DOD side, as you know, stability operations is now the third leg of the Army Field Manual. Offensive, defensive, and stability operations define how DOD approaches its mission in protecting U.S. interests. And, and the third leg is chiefly in contingency settings. Uh, the question is, how well is that in integrated with the other agencies that inevitably participate within overseas contingency operations, it's the State Department use it. So you have an architecture over here. State Department with no funding, no building. And you have lots of building over here. Uh, no, 
in the Defense Department, but not really a inter an integrated interagency architecture articulated uh, by either the Congress or the administration. It's driven by DOD Directive 3000.05. A lot of you are familiar with that. A lot of you are working on it. Uh, the and that's good. Those are good responses. The third, the third uh, response to trying to solve this problem was NSPD 44, uh, signed by President Bush over three years ago, that conceptualized and articulated the Civilian Reserve Corps concept. Um, not a lot has happened out of that that has made a significant difference in Iraq and Afghanistan. SCRS formed over uh, in the State Department to take on the mandate of NSPD 44 really didn't get funded until the last uh, year and a half. And as a result, they were functioning with detailees. They didn't really move forward uh, as, as perhaps was envisioned. So we have a series of solutions sort of simmering out there, some fairly robust on the DOD side, some uh, conceptually significant but not funded on the Department of State and USAID side. But what's missing is the integration. And that is the reality of hard lessons and what, I, what I've seen in my five years in carrying out this mission. And, and in what I heard in my last visit uh, to Iraq as I, as I briefed this report to both multinational force Iraq and the embassy personnel. And, and that is that, literally quote from the embassy briefing, we're not that much better off today than we were five years ago. And that's speaking to the systemic reality that there are still challenges, even with a much smaller reconstruction program that's going on in Iraq today, in operating in an integrated fashion. Why is that important? Less for Iraq today, but very important for Afghanistan tomorrow uh, and moving forward, the balance of this year into next year. Uh, $32 billion already expended there. Arnie Fields is, is looking into that. He's He's got a significant oversight mission, but I, I think his approach is the same as mine, and that's to use audits, inspections, investigations to improve the mission, to make a difference on the ground over there. And, and that uh, can only make a difference if the hard lessons of Iraq are applied effectively. And so that moves me to the tactical solutions that can be applied tomorrow and beyond in Afghanistan. And, and first and foremost is ensuring that the Afghan program, as it moves forward, built to the capacity of Afghanistan, built to the capabilities, to the absorptive capacity of that country, much lower than Iraq. Iraq, a much more sophisticated country, had, had much more to, there was much more to work with, so to speak, uh, with respect to the aid that we provided. Afghanistan, that's not the case. And, and so it would be a waste of money to go over there and build something like the Nazaria water treatment plant. Indeed, it was beyond Iraqi capacity, as our inspection pointed out. Uh, they, they did not know how to operate it once we turned it over to them in two, that September 2007. That's getting fixed, but we shouldn't be fixing what we finish. We ought to be building what works, and, that, and that's, that's point one. Uh, carefully plan with the Afghans uh, what it is that they need and can operate. Uh, second, uh, t uh, move forward with the contracting reforms that we recommended in our previous lessons learned reports and again here in hard lessons. Contingency contracting rules, I call it a CFAR, Contingency Federal Acquisition Regulation. Title 18 has it in there, but if you have to be a sophisticated contracting officer to know how to uh, use it. And, and the reality is, as the Gansler Commission pointed out, we've lost a lot of those officers over the last 15 years and we're now rebuilding our contracting core. But we don't have time in Afghanistan for that rebuilding to occur. What needs to happen now is a, is a reform so that the, the good training that's going on within the brigades and within DOD regarding contingency contracting is, is made more efficient and effective through, through more efficient and effective rules. And, and the current FAR trying to use FedBiz Ops over in Afghanistan on the ground to do a quick project doesn't make sense. Third, a lot, five years, six years into the Iraq Reconstruction Program, a lot of people have, have been through it understand it, especially the PRT program. So there is a, a, an amorphous but established civilian reserve corps of sorts out there, those that have worked in the, in the Iraqi PRTs, that have worked previously in Afghanistan, that, but there's no management system, there's no, there's no uh, database of who those people are and how they could be deployed. 
this is the time to, to move forward and, and take advantage of experience gains uh, in, in Iraq and apply it in Afghanistan. Uh, third, uh, or fourth, uh, key problem, uh, management problem that we identified at the outset, information systems. Even today, the Iraq Reconstruction Management System is barely a 70 percent solution. When I first uh, arrived over there, there was no plan uh, in place to develop a good system that would keep track of all the projects that were ongoing. I mean, it's, 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 it's axiomatic that to make good decisions, you have to have good information, and that good information in, 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 an, in a re contingency reconstruction operation is what's being built and by whom. And there's no system in Iraq. There was no system that, that kept track of it. Uh, our audits led to the development of the Iraq Reconstruction Management System. It's, it's been used uh, about 70 percent of the time. And, and in, in Afghanistan, there is no system. Uh, there, there are simply departmental uh, tracking uh, uh, databases. And, and the ambassador and the commanding general over there uh, have limited insight into, into what's going on. Uh, you know, f finally, I, I think that, that we have to, although it's a, a uh, strategic solution, for the long run. There has to be uh, a joint plan that integrates operations in Afghanistan. It's the key, the key lesson out of Iraq that, that ensures that the ambassador, the commanding general, and the mission director for USAID are uh, well connected, not just coordinated, but well connected operationally. So they understand how US resources are being expended across that vast country. Much more difficult, uh, I think, to operate in simply get topographically, uh, given the security situation uh, becoming more difficult uh, to move, uh, and given the, uh, the simply the uh, the very fractured nature of the society, uh, difficult to identify exactly what the indigenous interests are. Uh, that demands the kind of integration that that I'm speaking to uh, in Afghanistan. It's, it's not the systemic solution that I think that the Congress needs to develop. Now, let me just speak for a minute uh, on that and then, uh, and then tur turn it over, I think, Rick to, to speak about this, because Rick and I, I think, in a brainstorming session, struck upon, I think, this one, which I think is the best, is developing a, a USTR, a FEMA-like agency, a new entity within the Executive Office of the President that would prepare for and manage contingency operations, overseas contingency operations. And, and like USTR, it would, it would be relatively small uh, when there's not a contingency operation, uh, uh, although we've had one, one in perpetually going, going for the last uh, eight, seven years, uh, and then would expand uh, to meet the need uh, as it developed. Uh, I think that, that it, it, the uh, director of contingency operations should perhaps have cabinet level rank and have the, the uh, the, the resources to develop the Civilian Reserve Corps, to develop the systems I'm talking about, to ensure the contracting regulations are in place, and to ensure that those from the various agencies that would play a role know what that role is before it begins. I mean, the truth is the, the first year of the Iraq Reconstruction Program was an adhocracy. These were temporary agencies, n none of which exist today, uh, created to spend uh, $20 billion dollars that they never got to spend because there wasn't time to compete those contracts and get the money on the ground to execute it. Uh, and it, and it, was, it was that, that year, 2003-2004, was a year of constantly shifting policies uh, in order to deal with the inevitable shifts that occur in contingencies. You need to have established structures that are resilient, trained, and ready to go. That's why DOD can deal with, with the constantly changing environment of conflict. In, and, and they are trained and, and prepared to do that. You don't know what the conflict's going to look like exactly, but you are trained and ready for change. Uh, you can't do that with a temporary organization. It doesn't have staff in place. It doesn't know each other. shows up and tries to rebuild a country with $20 billion, achieves short-term gains that were not sustainable. Uh, that, uh, the, um, so so that's, that's, the, that's the reality, I think, that, that, that needs to be captured for Afghanistan in the tactical solution level. In the strategic solutions, uh, I think the best would be to create a new agency. There, the other two approaches would be to 
to empower the Department of Defense as the lead entity and integrate the Department of State into it through the – through – which would require significantly altering what, what the RISCMA proposes. Uh, in other words, statutize 3000.05 and, and fold in, as you statutize it, USAID and Department of State interest. That, that, that's, that's, a, that's a cat fight waiting to happen, of course, among SASC and, and – uh, and the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, so tough one. Uh, and and the other the other cat fight would be uh, would be to to uh, put the department to to embolden and empower RISCMA and 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 make the uh, Department of Defense the the supportive player. Uh, and both of those um, are difficult. As General Petraeus said to me when I interviewed him for for uh, hard lessons. He said, you know, ambassador's not going to work for a general. General's not going to work for an ambassador. Uh, so I don't know how – his answer was, I don't know how you'd achieve unity of command, which is what we're talking about. But unity – but at the same time, both he and Ambassador Crocker said to me that unity of command, that the absence thereof in Iraq was a key problem. So what – you know, how do we move out of that conundrum? And, and, and the answer is, I think, through significant systemic reform. The president is in charge of all generals and ambassadors. He has the authority to manage it, but he can't manage it tactically, obviously. What, what is that solution? Perhaps it's a USTR-like entity. Perhaps it's empowering DOD more. Perhaps it's in, in the state. Or perhaps it's creating a Department of Foreign Aid, something wholly new, you know, that would, that would make uh, USAID a separate agency and, and assign them the task of, 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 uh, of this. You know, that, those are, those are, these are new options, new ways forward. Uh, but they fill; they would fill a vacuum because um, it would be crazy to continue to approach contingencies the way we have. So thank you uh, again for for coming out. We look forward to your Q and A. Uh, and Rick, I think you're up up next. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, thank you very much, Stuart, and and uh, thank you all for being here. I I thought that what I might do is. Uh, just uh, present four questions to you, Stuart, that uh, I think would follow up on things that you said and maybe a couple, a couple of uh, essay questions to, to make sure you've got the graduate degree as well. Uh, but I, I thought it would be useful to start with how many people here have, have spent time in Iraq? I'm just curious. <laughs> okay. And how many have spent time in Afghanistan? Um, and and how about Bosnia or another one of those? Okay, so a pretty good a pr sort of reconfirming your point, Stuart, that there is a, a civilian corps out here uh, that a lot of people with direct experience. One other question that I thought would be interesting: How many people have primarily worked for the Defense Department, primarily for the State Department, primarily for AID? And just to, so we get a sense of the audience as well, how many people? For the for the Defense Department, okay, and how many for the State Department, and how many uh, for AID? Okay, for one, two or more of the above. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I think Good. we have a strategic systemic solution. In the <laughs> <laughs> We're glad to see that you're at least mixing it here in the audience. Um, I, I had expected to see the Defense Department, the State Department, and the AID people. Um, Maybe one last question. How many people uh, have, have had mostly a congressional view of this? Okay. So, uh, oh, and, uh, and I, you know, I didn't ask really an important question, uh, maybe harder to get hands. I guess all those who don't raise their hands will be the answer to this question for the intelligence uh, side of the <laughs> – <laughs> okay, that's what we thought. Um, Anyway, thank you very much. I think – thank you, Stuart. I think you've really brought forward some great points. What I'd like to do is, is maybe probe in a couple of areas that I think are still troubling and, if possible, to get you to, uh, to cite kind of an example or a story that brings forward the, the answer to this question because I think you're, the, the depth of your knowledge of the situation on the ground and the breadth of your experience there and of your team has, is really uh, rather unique. And there are very, very few people that have, that have had the ongoing assignment that you've had. Many people have come and gone during the time you were there. 
you know, there are very few people that have cut across everything the way you have and been able to look at anything that you wanted to. So, so the stove piping and the assignment systems and some of the other limitations that I think are a problem in each one of these places, as we know, uh, you don't have that. So I'd like you to, if possible, as you think of the answers, bring us to an example in, in every case that you can. And the first, the first issue that I'd raise is, how do we get the appropriate balance of outsiders and locals? Everybody talks about local ownership is critical, and yet uh, your review and, and much of our review tends to be, well, what the United States could do better, what the international community could do better. And one thing we know we could do better is how is to get into local ownership faster. Uh, you mentioned it in the capacity development area. But I think if you could maybe give us an example of what you think was the best case of kind of a local ownership being developed in, in Iraq, of something that you saw that just seemed to be Hmm. Either that, either that ministry or that project or whatever that was, that had these qualities, and it doesn't have to be the central government level. It could be right down to a local civil, civic group if if you think that was the best one. But part of what we have to do is replicate success, and and of course you've had the opportunity to critique failure as well as, but the replicating. So that would be one question. The second one that I would have for you is, we know that unity of command seems to be elusive, but unity of leadership. Uh, is is a, it may be achievable, and clearly we've had many many cases in in uh, in American success stories where we've had what could be called co leadership that that partners at the top who managed to produce something that was greater than the sum of of uh, two people working together. And I would ask, what when were we best connected in Iraq in the time that you've been there, and why? Uh, what were the critical elements that 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 made if we didn't if we didn't get it as as good as you would like us to have gotten it what when did we get it best uh, and uh, the third the third question I would have for you is the civilian role there's a great deal of conversation about well you've got to have more civilians you've got to have more civilians you've got to have more civilians but you have uh, you have reported the huge number of fatalities and casualties on the civilian side, which uh, is is greatly exceeds anything that anybody could have imagined, and way beyond a standard OSHA violation. Uh, uh, and the same thing is is taking shape in uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, the last time I heard about it, the the AID fatalities. In, uh, on AID funded projects in in uh, Afghanistan was over 400 people, which is a pretty big number. Now that's not Americans, and but if if you were running AID and they were on your payroll, you'd be you should have responsibility, and that would be a very very severe responsibility. So how do we? What is the right balance, and what should be the profile of civilians in these places? And again, where did you see the best uh, sort of civilian operation in your – because you've seen the PRTs, you've seen it all, and there are probably some that you really admired and others uh, – anyway, the best case again. And finally, kind of the essay question, uh, which is, what do you think the future cases are going to look like? I mean, we have, we have two legacy wars, uh, and so those are the ones that are on our minds, and we are trying to uh, – make changes, and we've been making changes in them all along. But the future cases might well be Pakistan or Nigeria, places that dwarf uh, the, the challenges that we've seen in Iraq or Afghanistan. And obviously, there's going to be a huge reluctance on the part of the American public, and I think probably most of the federal government, to have the kind of engagement model that we've had in these places. So. The adaptability to the future depends a little bit on what we think the future is going to look like, and I think you've probably thought about it, and, and we haven't we haven't benefited from hearing uh, those insights. So those would be four issues that I'd love to uh, have you address, if you if you would. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. And and I'm going to maybe call on Vicky and Chris who uh, to help supplement things I may miss and Ginger. Uh, but first question: local interest. Uh, and it is one of the hard lessons, one of our 13 lessons that is critical, and it's, it's really axiomatic. It's not, really, it's not a lesson. 
just wasn't followed very well uh, in Iraq. It's critical to consider and, and build to the capacity and needs of the indigenous population. Uh, that's that's self-evident, I think. There, there was some consultation. Now, the CPA says that they did visit with uh, Iraqis, uh, but the Iraqis we interviewed said it wasn't enough. Uh, the, the proof is in the outcome, uh, and that is, is, is uh, an audit that we'll issue in the next month will reveal the asset transfer process as we give the projects we built to Iraqis back to them is not working. It's been broken. And and one of the reasons it's broken is that they don't want what we've built. Uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of projects have been unilaterally transferred back to Iraq because they refuse to sign the paperwork. So we just give them the keys and say, it's yours. That's waste and unwise and a symptom of a failure to, to effectively engage with the indigenous population early on as we developed that 3,000 project list in 2003. Best case, though, there, there, there are good, good inspections we have done, and, and the, the, I think the single best investment uh, in any project in Iraq was the pipeline exclusion zone. We, we uh, in our reports in 2005-2006, identified the obvious uh, that the infrastructure insecurity in Iraq was holding back the country. Uh, and holding down oil exports. And in, in 2006, the United States engaged on a program to protect those pipelines, uh, invested in, the, for instance, the Beji to Baghdad pipeline, which was hit a lot yeah, early on, uh, $32 million. And that line has not been successfully attacked for 18 months since, since completion. And it, it is managed, it is run, it's concertina wire and guard towers and Iraqi security forces guarding it, uh, and, and it works, and, it, and it's worked up in the north. The Shayon line, uh, which was inoperable for, for three years, has been, been open for most of the last year, exporting uh, oil to Turkey and, and accounting for the, the, uh, the rise and sustained rise of oil exports above pre-war levels. Uh, so those are two examples of indigenous success. Do you, Chris and Vicky, do you have a one? Ginger? The Erbil Police Academy was inspected by our inspectors, and the thing that distinguished that project was the working with the Erbil government. Uh, now, it was a safer region, true, but there was a buy-in by the Erbil government to design a police academy in which the United States government paid $10 million to build portions of the police academy. The Erbil government dedicated $5 million to build other portions of it. It worked together, and what that ensured was buy-in, it helped develop capacity, uh, they learned how to do better quality assurance and quality control. It was really working side by side with the Iraqis to produce a project versus having a multinational corporation sweep in, build it, and then leave. So that was another example I think that would work. Yeah, and, and part of the reality that, that uh, success there evidences uh, that there are two Iraqs. There's Kurdistan and the rest of Iraq. You know, to, many of you I'm sure know that for an Arab Iraqi to travel to Kurdistan, they've got to show papers at the, at the Green Line wherever that green line is, by the way. And, uh, and that's a rather stark fact that underscores, I think, as a little aside, the biggest issue of 2009 is, is Arab Kurd tensions. Uh, you know, there was some shooting along the green line last year, uh, low level, got tamped down. But I met with Prime Minister Maliki a month ago, uh, and, uh, and he said that uh, he got very animated <laughs> in saying that he was upset that the Kurds were exporting oil from from uh, from Kirkuk and elsewhere and that he was going to take it out of their 17 percent you know they get 17 percent of the budget under the Constitution uh, well you know that's that's not going to help matters uh, and and the other thing I learned in this trip is that the Kurdish leadership is largely absent from Baghdad now uh, I don't know whether that's reflective of giving up on that on some of these issues are reflective of firming up their views of where the green line should be. Stefan de Mistura has a huge 
task this year. Article 23 process is not easy, but at least they're communicating at this stage. And, uh, and the more they talk, uh, the less likely they'll shoot. And, uh, and we can hope that that will, that will come to resolution because the Turks are lingering just uh, to the northwest with, with uh, a lot of weapons. Um, unity of command, the second point. And th that is that is a core issue, obviously, as I uh, addressed, in, and 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 all of you have been in Iraq and Afghanistan and know what I'm talking about. Uh, you, if you, if you worked operationally and you worked for DoD, you've probably shaken your head and said, "Why is you say doing that?" And vice versa. You know, if you're working for a state, you're wondering why. You know, why won't DoD uh, uh, get out of the ministry hallways? We're we're supposed to be handling this. You know, what's CJ9 doing? Mission creep. This is all reflective, I think, of a bubbling debate, an internal unresolved reality, of how uh, how the United States is going to manage this mission, this, this overseas contingency operation mission, and that specific specifically sort of the post-conflict phase. You know, the DoD is heavily engaged with the ministries. You know, uh, um, and General Petraeus is approach was to do that, and, and General Odierno has, has moved forward with it, and, and part of it is that they have the resources, the manpower to do that beyond what the Department of State does, but it, it, it created tension that I saw and that you all lived, I'm sure, if you were involved with it. But where did it work? And I think it did work well at the high level, I think, and, and it worked well when there was a clearly articulated strategy, the counterinsurgency doctrine, that General Petraeus brought forward in 2007. To, to which uh, Ambassador Crocker added his robust voice and, and the resources he had. And, and, and by reflecting uh, from the top a, a true synchronicity in their approach to, to, what, to, the, to the desperate situation that Iraq was facing in early 2007, uh, we saw significant success in the, in the civilian and the military surge. Don't forget that success was supplemented by important strategic moves, namely the Sons of Iraq, buying 100,000 Sunnis and turning them into security personnel, essentially getting them off the enemy's rolls, and two, uh, the Sadr ceasefire. You know, if you look at a reconstruction project map of Baghdad and you, and you, you look at Sadr City, you can't see <laughs> the map if it's for the dots of reconstruction projects in Sadr City. Hundreds and hundreds of projects have been there. There's no accident that that occurred and that the ceasefire was there. I mean, th these were intelligent, smart uses of soft power to, to, which to, take, to, to take a uh, significant opponent out of action on the other side. Those three elements deploying the troops, the Sadr ceasefire and the SOI, I think were all at least equally uh, important uh, in, in success of the surge along with the unity of command. These were matters that, that the Department of State, USAID, for the most part, and, uh, and DOD clearly were, were pushing forward. Uh, so what's the lesson for that? I think uh, that in that coordination, you affected uh, some integrated op integration of operations. But that's not a systemic change. <coughs> the systemic repair is yet to be done. That's the power of two very strong and, and, and gifted personalities and leadership at the same time. Three, uh, the civilian role, I mean, you're right, Rick, it, it, it is the, the, the deadliest war, I think, for, for civilians, uh, those contractors, U.S. civilians, and reporters, by the way. Uh, uh, although uh, this last quarter there were no uh, deaths uh, in, over there of reporters, it, it has been a very, very tough hoe for them. 1,300 claims filed with the Department of Labor for, for contractor deaths over the last five years. Uh, 278 civilian deaths reported by the Department of State. It's, it's been a very dangerous place. A year ago, day before yesterday, uh, an auditor working for me was killed in a rocket attack on Easter Day in, uh, in the Green Zone. I had five wounded a year before. And this, is, this has been oversight under fire, reconstruction under fire. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's the harsh reality of, of an overseas contingency operation that, uh, uh, that, uh, that there, there will be losses, which makes it all the more important to prepare well ahead of time, to have the personnel ready to know what they're going to engage in. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the lessons learned, though, that we've seen 
uh, sort of uh, Rick was asking for best case a civilian operation that worked out last November I, I went out to PRT Hilla we've seen a PRT program that has evolved very effectively from a very difficult start uh, who worked on PRTs in Iraq in here right here and so you know er, er, early on there was speaking of lack of integration great breakdown between DOD and the Department of State. It took nine months to, to work out a memo on how you would protect the PRT personnel. You know, it started in November 2005. It didn't get going until the summer of 2006. Lost, you know, nine months is an eternity in trying to make progress in Iraq. And, uh, and but those, those are the things that should be worked out ahead of time. You don't, you don't have DOD and DOS lawyers fighting over here about who pays for what. Uh, but in Hilla, you know, the, the, here four years later, you, you see what could have been, frankly. You know, a, you know, a program that is starting to, to uh, de-escalate uh, because, because it's fundamentally tied to, the, uh, to, to uh, area protection by U.S. military uh, is, is actually working quite well with the Iraqis and, and, and also, unfortunately, when the money's running out. So that there, there is engagement. There are relationships. Uh, there is integration there, but it's but it's uh, you know it's written in the sand, not institutionalized, and it will it will uh, be it will blow away uh, as it de-escalates, and and uh, I think that's where the systemic reform needs to capture it, and the tactical reform needs to use it in Afghanistan. Finally, briefly on the future cases, uh, Pakistan. Nigeria, you mentioned, or Zimbabwe and Somalia also. I mean, certainly uh, there, are, there are lots of simmering pots out there. Uh, Pakistan, probably the hottest one right now. And, um, and, and I think that uh, the, the tactical reforms and the strategic reforms uh, need to be expeditiously applied and developed uh, because uh, the short answer to your question is yes, another contingency is coming. Uh, it, it is, uh, and we need to be ready, you know, and, and it's, it's not that it wasn't recognized. Let me just briefly read uh, the epigraphs. As a matter of fact, if you, read, if you read anything from Hard Lessons, you might read uh, the epigraphs because they're, they're taken from the interviews I had. Uh, there's uh, one at the beginning of each chapter and, and in front with senior leaders, and they give the tone of what happened. And here's what Secretary Rumsfeld said to me about this issue. It has long been a concern of mine that the U.S. government lacks a standing capability in the area of reconstruction and that there is no long-established team of civilians, let alone an experienced joint civilian-military team, to handle the challenges of major post-conflict tasks. Uh, you know, a man with extensive understanding who tried through NSPD 24 uh, to implement that. But, again, it itself was an ad hoc attempt. To, f to fill a vacuum, and that the vacuum is that to which he spoke to me uh, last year when we were working on this. So do, do you, excuse me, let, let me, Vicki, Chris, uh, Ginger, any, any thoughts on any of that? Okay. Brad? Thanks, Ray, and Rick, for having me here. Um, as journalists, we, uh, we work under the faith that more sunshine is always better, and uh, hard lessons clearly sheds an awful lot of sunshine on uh, a massive undertaking. Um, and let me just add here and interrupt. We're on the record today if anybody was interested. <laughs> um, I something, yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, I, would feel, I would feel a little bit odd if I were not on the record, uh, <laughs> given my job. Sunshine in here. Right. Um, in the media, as, as a journalist, it's often felt, I've often felt that we get sort of the uh, the blind man and the elephant's view of what's going on in Iraq. You know, one one person feels the trunk and says, "Well, it looks like this." One person feels the leg and says, "No, it looks like this." Um, it it is wonderful and I think vital to have uh, a team putting together a, a book like this that is so comprehensive and lays out so many of the problems. Um, the there are five. Uh, five main problems that are highlighted, five themes that, that talk about why uh, things went so wrong. Uh, security, of course. Uh, when things aren't safe, you can't get anything done. The, the course changes. The, at the very highest levels, it, the, the national leadership couldn't decide which way, how it wanted to approach Iraq and the reconstruction of it. Um, lack of, of 
uh, procurement policies and, and policies that dictated how contractors operated. Uh, the uh, interagency, the lack of interagency uh, cooperation and coordination, finally the turnover of personnel. And it's these last two um, that I think speak to a, a, another theme that, uh, that could be talked about here. It's the flow of information. There are so many points during this endeavor when it just breaks your heart to see that uh, information developed in one area was not heeded or not known about elsewhere. The future of Iraq project is just one of those. Um, the question becomes, how do you make sure that everybody has the relevant information? And I, th and I know that you tried to stay away from the political, but I think it can't be helped but, n but noting that the past administration was uh, – was almost reflexive in its, in its desire to classify and, and close hold and keep information uh, where it was. Um, and we all know all sorts of things fester in darkness. Um, <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> yeah, we know what we spread on them. Um, unity of command, the kind of USTR thing that, that you're talking about is a possibility thing. This is one way that you make sure that, that information flows. Uh, but I would be curious to hear how important you think creating um, a, a culture of, of communication, of, of uh, information flow, of disclosure is, and what steps you think might be taken to, uh, to improve this. Um, another question I had for you is you have been, you and your organization have been clearly an oversight organization. You've, You've tried to look at, uh, at what happened, lay it out, organize it, think about it, analyze it. And now it seems you're entering a new period where you have the fruits of your labors and you're trying to now make them known. And so although you, you I, I'm sure, would bristle at being called an advocacy group, nevertheless, this book is testament to uh, your effort to get these lessons out there. And I'd be curious to know uh, what your plans are for uh, for making sure that these lessons are heeded. Thanks, Brad. Uh, I think uh, unity of command, as I've said, is is the key, and and developing a culture of better communication, as you say, uh, will be a symptom of 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 unity of command. Uh, as I said a minute ago, Secretary Rumsfeld, I think, identified the problem. It reflected in NSPD 24 of the of of trying to run a complex contingency uh, with 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 several secretaries, several commanders, ambassadors, generals uh, running different parts of it simultaneously. Uh, but that NSPD was signed uh, uh, on January 20th of 2003, and we invaded uh, two months later. Uh, and it it it. It, uh, it recognized the problem, but the, 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 the space it tried to fill was so huge and there were no resources. ORHA, Organization for Relief and Humanitarian, Reconstruction, Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance, yeah, Ray was part of that, uh, uh, couldn't do it. You know, it's spelled out in detail, painful detail in the, in the first three chapters, five chapters of this, of, of hard lessons. Uh, and, and at the same time, while he, identified that problem and tried to solve it, he simultaneously superseded uh, an NSC-managed planning process. Uh, it was described to us in our interviews as a hostile takeover by the DOD of the entire process. And, and it, it set the stage for departmental breakdowns that would burden the reconstruction process for years to follow. Uh, it, it erupted again. Uh, just five months later, in the summer of 2003, when, again, the lack of the culture of, of communication, the CPA moved forward with a massive development program without really talking to USAID. Uh, and it alienated uh, the, that important agency. Uh, and, and CPA was a DOD entity. And again, it, again, it, 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 it uh, fostered uh, this breakdown. Uh, that 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 proved to be uh, to, uh, a burden for you for years to come. Uh, all of this is symptomatic of not having a system that's well trained, well developed, well thought through. I keep coming back to that because it's the problem. It's the strategic reality uh, within uh, managing overseas contingency operations. And as I said, we're not that much better off 
systemically than we were uh, six years ago. Vicki? Vicki, one of the things it's on okay one of the things in in hard lessons that we point at but we don't really develop and I think needs to be looked at very very seriously in the future is communications not only between departments and between our agencies but when you're talking about buy-in from the local community you have to have reconstruction money that goes into radio and television to communicate with the people that you're ostensibly trying to help. And it has to have <coughs> relevant information. And in that way, you make people partners. Now, we had uh, a program early on, but we were broadcasting Egyptian soap operas to Iraqis in the early days. You can't get a free flow of information. And I, I had the privilege of working for the electoral component in Cambodia during the UN mission in Cambodia. And I would say that that information and education operation is an example that we could, we could go back on. You, you have to have, at one point, 90% of the Cambodian population was listening to Radio Intact. They sold out radios. Why? Because actual useful information that made Cambodians a part of that process, as imperfect as it was, helped get the buy-in for the election that was accepted by the majority of the population. And we never did that in Iraq. We never, and part of it is this desire on the part of bureaucrats to keep things secret. You know, they're, they're, somehow you have to surrender the desire to control everything. And it's really hard for governments to do that. But, but we need to be thinking about that, because otherwise you'll never get popular buy-in. Well, you're you you're right, Vicki. You're right. It came up yesterday at the Hask hearing. Uh, Congressman Marshall, I believe it was, just offered a, his own commentary on his experience. He'd been to Iraq a lot, and he, he talked to the leadership. Uh, and, and he said just in the last months, uh, some of the commanders, I think he said a general who'd been in leadership over there, had come to him. And, and he said, you know, we've got this report now, and, and this is what was going on, and it wasn't what you were telling me. Uh, why, why were you telling me something different? He said, well, we were told to. And, and I think that's reflective of some of what you were referring to, Brad, that there were, you know, there were some political pressures in there, but I think they're also, also reflective of what Vicky's talking to, and that's the departmental turf, interdepartmental turf wars. You know, it, that's never going to go away, obviously, in Washington. But, but when you're protecting U.S. interests abroad, when you go beyond the shores, which, which is what this is, this is about protecting our interests abroad in contingency settings, uh, those have to be supplemented by a structure that reduces their impact upon the management of a contingency. You know, there, I've said this before, and I'll say it again now. You know, there, there's three, there are sort of three scenarios, three settings wherein uh, U.S. interests are protected abroad. Pre-conflict, the Department of State has charge of that and does a great job, keeps us out of conflict when we get into it. The Department of Defense is best ever at it. We, we you know, we're victorious uh, almost too quickly, you know, almost in Iraq. Suddenly there was victory in the... Uh, but the victory also showed that in post-conflict or contingency settings, we don't have a well-developed system for who's in charge and who manages it. That's, that's the story. That's the large story of Iraq. And, that, uh, and, and we have to react to that. And, and it's, it's not, frankly, a new lesson. Uh, it, uh, as, as Doug Fife said uh, to me in his interview, he said, hey, for 40 years, ever since World War II, our contingency operation management has been ad hoc. You know, so he ad hoc it. Uh, that's 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 the that's one conclusion to draw from that. But we shouldn't leave it be. And th and that's your that addresses your other point, Brad, which is what to do, uh, and and why 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 hard lessons. And and I, and I am an advocate for reform. Because that is, a, that is an Inspector General's <coughs> mission is to I, not just identify what doesn't work, but to pr propose uh, what would. And, and that's been my, my philosophy from the start, as I tell every auditor that comes to work for me, uh, 
don't bring me an audit with just a finding. Bring me an audit that, if it has a finding, has a solution too, and preferably has a solution already worked out, and preferably has already been implemented. And and I think, uh, you know, and that's hard to do when we crank out audits at a at, 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 uh, quick pace. Three months is you, is our typical time. But we've done that most of the time. I, I think, and, and, and General Odierno, I met with him a couple of weeks ago in Iraq, said, you know, he, uh, that's what he looks for from SIGGER. And he, he's glad that he's fully supportive of us having our 35 people over there uh, because we want, to, we want to give him useful information. A nine-month-old audit is, is dead in the water, you know, over in Iraq. No time. No time to make a difference there. Uh, a three-month-old one, you can, you can shift, shift course. <clears throat> I'm just going to be brief and ask one question because I see in the audience uh, a number of uh, folks who are informed and experienced, not the least of which is, as Stuart said, uh, our, uh, our friend and colleague, General Fields, the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction. And of course, General Peak is over here, our former Army Surgeon General and Secretary of Veterans Affairs, and Secretary Trip Cassells is in the front row. and. I see many general officers and civilian equivalent general officers in the, in the audience. Um, I've got one question, Stuart. I, as many in this audience, uh, spent a number of uh, trips to Iraq and Afghanistan. I can remember one in particular when I was with Congressman Duncan Hunter, then chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, and we landed uh, in Baghdad uh, out at uh, the airport. and. It was the day that Jerry Bremer was departing. But it wasn't known that it was the day that Jerry Bremer was departing. And we got off the plane and we were escorted into that building over there on the side to get briefed by General uh, Rick Sanchez, the senior military officer on, uh, in country. And we sat down and we're getting the brief. And the brief was just about ending. And on the side door opened up and came through uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Sally, Barm Sally, uh, with Jerry Bremer. And uh, Ambassador Bremer came over and said hello to Chairman Hunter and myself. And General Sanchez and Jerry Bremer not only did not say hello to each other, not only did not recognize each other's presence, they turned their backs on each other. There was frost, snow, ice in that room, for personality-wise. Um, I was taken aback, I must tell you. And uh, when I came back from that trip, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld asked me for a quick report orally, and I, of course, put things in writing, and that was my opening statement. I said, boss, there is some serious issues with respect to the military civilian uh, lash up over there. Um, Stewart made a comment about General Petraeus saying state is never going to put an ambassador under a general and DOD is never going to put a general under an ambassador. I'm reminded what well, some of my British friends, specifically I think it was Sir, uh, General Sir Richard Dennett said to me, we in Great Britain have done this before. It can be done. Just because you've never done it before doesn't mean you shouldn't consider it. There was a time when Jerry Bremer was threatening to resign as CPA, and he'd come back from a secure video, and <laughs> Rumsfeld says, sh shaking his head, and I said to him, you know, if he does, you know, there are other options. And he said, like what? And I said, why don't you consider asking General Jim Jones, then the SACUR, to become the ambassador in Iraq? and have control over everything, including the military. There was a silence in the room. Several general officers were sort of turning their necks. But at least I thought it was an opportunity for a new construct that might have been more successful than the one we had. My question, why, in your view, Stuart, did, and you talked about the strong, powerful, gifted leadership of both Ryan Crocker and Dave Petraeus. What was different about the Crocker-Petraeus lash-up, in your view, than the Bremer-Sanchez lash-up? Well, well, there were, there, were, uh, there were a lot of breakdowns. I attended uh, staff meetings 
uh, if, during CPA era, and I never saw Sanchez or Bremer talk to one another. Uh, and so it, it wasn't just on departure day. Uh, it it uh, it was it was a uh, it was a headache that uh, pervaded uh, the experience. And those of you who were there at CPA know what I'm talking about. And my interviews with uh, Ambassador Bremer and General Sanchez uh, last year substantiated that. Uh, I didn't include most of the quotes, but they're there. Uh, and, uh, but I think that, that I think there was a real problem uh, in appointing Jerry Bremer envoy to Iraq and administrator of CPA. As a special envoy to Iraq, he reported to the president, and as administrator of the CPA, he reported to Secretary Rumsfeld. So he had, there were two chains of command. And and that's that's a death knell for for uh, for sink management. If uh, if if the if the chains are are uh, if the wires cross, you're going to get a short circuit. And and there were short circuits galore in in Iraq. And let me just read you a quotation from from Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage. Uh, uh, you remember you you all remember in September of. 2003, uh, Ambassador Bremer published a seven-point plan in the Post uh, about the future of, of um, CPA. And, and Secretary Rumsfeld and Doug Fice said that was the first they'd heard of it. Ambassador Bremer says, no, he told the DOD, whatever, and we, we just report the facts here. You all can decide, but <laughs> someone else said that. But, but the, uh, the, uh, the reality is, is the repercussions of that article led, I think, to the November 15th decision, announced November 15th, to close CPA. But it was bubbling up because immediately after it appeared, militating in favor of, I guess, a DOD position on that article, uh, Condoleezza Rice formed the White House uh, Iraq Stabilization Group. Uh, so with that pr uh, preface, uh, Sec uh, Secretary Armitage told me, one day in the fall of 2003, we were coming out of the White House Situation Room and Dr. Rice turned to Rumsfeld, and I was between the two of them, and she kind of leaned over and said, Don, would you call Jerry and have him do X, Y, or Z? And Rumsfeld said, no, he doesn't work for me. And, and she said, yes, he does. Well, then who does he work for? And Rumsfeld said, he works for the NSC. And this is because Rumsfeld found out that Jerry was at least communicating with, if not taking instructions from the National Security Advisor. That was in October of 2003. Uh, you know, CPA was five months old, uh, four months old, really, and 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 it was clear from that quotation. You just need to hear that to know the, the chain of command. The management system was broken, uh, and and it wasn't just broken between Baghdad and Washington. It was broken in Baghdad, uh, as as uh, Sanchez uh, told me. It just it just there was not an effective relationship between CJTF seven. And, and the CPA. And, and ultimately, Ray, your suggestion was a good one. Uh, it, it would have improved matters. Thank you. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. All right, let's take some questions from the audience. Please wait for the microphone, this lady here, and identify yourself and keep the speeches short, the questions pertinent. Uh, Trudy Rubin from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, you touched on the issue of contractors very briefly. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to ask is that uh, in Iraq, where I've spent a lot of time, clearly one of the things that worked very poorly, according to your report, and angered Iraqis greatly, was the handoff of projects by USAID to contractors, um, something that for many reasons worked badly in most cases. Now, do you think that USAID should be configured uh, reconfigured so that technical expertise is vested more in that agency and you had less handoff to contractors and less of AID being what some now say it is, which is mainly a contracting agency. And following from that, do you think that more aid in Afghanistan should be funneled through Afghan ministries and should a big effort be made, bigger effort be made to train them up, sort of like training up the Afghan army so one can route more projects directly through Afghans. Uh, for, first of all, uh, 
as, as, as I'm sure you know, USAID has suffered a significant cut in its capacity over the last uh, uh, 20 years, sort of, sort of uh, instead of a post-Cold War benefit, it's turned into a post-Cold War hangover because it's a capacity that was found needed in, in Iraq and was missing. And, and you are right uh, in to say that USAID has has uh, works chiefly through contractors. And that's that's certainly the case. It creates uh, a challenge in in oversight as well in Iraq because uh, those contractors, many of them, uh, subcontract to Iraqis, and and that diffuses out uh, how the money is used to, to to places we can't get to, and people we can't talk to, and so to. To, we can they, the, they report more on outputs than outcomes as a result sometimes. And that, that has, uh, as our audits have shown, uh, presented uh, a, a difficulty in accounting for the use of taxpayer dollars in those programs. At the same time, the, the, the efficacy of using Iraqis and, and getting to your Afghan question uh, is, is, is twofold. One, it, it improves security. You have uh, an indigenous uh, face operating, uh, carrying out a program at local levels where uh, uh, a U.S. Uh, presence might be rejected. Uh, and, and two, you have, you, you, you are, as by using indigenous uh, staff, you're developing a capacity that will stay uh, in the country and, and that's, that also is familiar uh, to those to whom you're trying to reach. Uh, so it's a balancing question, but I, I think I think what's what's not in the balance is the reality that if if the United States is in future contingencies, overseas contingency operations is going to project effectively soft power, the the the, the vogue phrase of the day, then uh, then USAID needs to be uh, redeveloped, uh, to use an apt term, and and uh, and that so that it has a cords like capacity. What 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 worked in reasonably well in Vietnam, uh, where it was targeted effectively, uh, could be used in Afghanistan and beyond. Uh, you know, frankly, the PRTs are Cords-like creation. Uh, we had to sort of reinvent Cords through the PRTs, and, and it was really Ambassador Khalilzad who brought them from Afghanistan, as you know. Uh, and, they're, and they're inaptly named. They're not reconstruction teams, really. They are, they are development teams. It might better be called provincial development teams, and that's what Cords was, a, a development team combining military and a very robust USAID presence that was not available in 2003. Okay, next question. Yes, ma'am, in the middle here. PRT member. <laughs> I'm Myron Astory, the World Bank. Um, <clears throat> given that the managing U.S. agencies was such a challenge and kind of a herding cats issue. In Afghanistan, you have a multitude of international organizations that we all know have not been well coordinated and don't mm -hmm. talk to each other and there's duplication and you know um, exclusion, et cetera. How would you suggest <coughs> that we, our general fields, manage that huh. is my first question. Yeah. And then the second question is about the databases. I think that's a really, really valid point that you raised about the project databases. At present, um, in Afghanistan, we don't have anything like that. Um, in, the Minister of Finance, Dr. Ashraf Ghani, had created the donor-assisted databases, but that was discarded, and that was the only real tool where they monitored inflows and outflows. And your point you just made about focusing on outcomes as opposed to you know, process indicators yeah. is very well taken, because we just had a report from Gurish, which is a, a city in, Lush, in, in Helmand province, which is where I was based in Afghanistan, and um, the metric they gave for improved economic activity was that there were more cars in the marketplace and mm -hmm. more bustling, which, you know, I'd like to see GNP per capita baseline. No, it's next. anecdotal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. And, sorry, I won't ask you that. Thank you. Okay. Well, two, two good questions, and, and, and your first one underscores the, the reality that the problem, the challenge in Afghanistan is greater than in Iraq. Uh, because it's it's not a coalition that's U.S. dominated. It's an it's an alliance uh, where, from a military and a development side, uh, you have uh, diffused responsibilities, uh, and that that's that's just going to make it extremely difficult. I think that that in developing a joint strategy 
the jointness must seek to not just achieve interdepartmental uh, interoperability, but but international uh, uh, integration. Uh, because, and I think the World Bank needs to play uh, a leading role, and 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 there's room for a compact, sort of an international compact for Afghanistan, like there is in Iraq now, that that defines, that that, that imposes some conditionality on con on continuing aid. Uh, I think that that conditionality was missing in Iraq for, for many years. Uh, there is a $50 billion no-strings-attached aid package that we gave Iraq, uh, unlike the Marshall Plan, by the way, very, very much different. Uh, we, that's a lesson learned to, as we move more aid towards Afghanistan, that, that we should bring conditionality, but the conditionality of that aid for it to work uh, should include uh, international components. And I think part of the international compact would be to put put the in the UN the World Bank in as, as a major uh, tr transparency oversight player in the use of funds that demands uh, certain activities certain outcomes not in, in response to the outputs the databases I mean as I said if you, if you don't have good information how can you make good judgments you can't make good decisions if you don't know what's being built you know you're gonna end up like like that like in Hilla in November you know the PRT leader uh, uh, when I was there, says to me, you know, I've got the Iraqis knocking on my door asking me to finish a courthouse that CERP was built by a brigade commander with CERP money, and and he didn't even know about it. Uh, that's that's a, that's within our own system. You know, expand that to the international uh, stage. That that is that is the Iraq that is the Afghan development process, and you've got a you've got an array of challenges that are enormous. Thank you, Jack. Wait, wait for the mic and. Tell our friends here who you are. Jack Shaw, late of defense, AID, state, you name it. Uh, I'm cautiously optimistic about the idea that you have of, of putting together a USTR uh, prototype to, to deal with these things because there has to be centralization. I had the unfortunate uh, uh, experience of having put together in 1989 the Woods Report at AID, which was trying to do the same thing, which but unfortunately had Alan Woods die on us and became the dead letter that often happens in Washington. But they lead to, that, that leads to, to a central thing that you raised. Personnel, people, are policy. We've just been through that on, on questions of, of Jerry Bremer and, and uh, Sanchez and, and, and the evolution there. And it, it's true at the top two. All of these, all of the decisions that are made about people take the, the policy decisions and put them into a particular bracket. So it's essential that you, you start on that. Number two, the thing that I think is, is, uh, is equally central, because we're, we're looking now, as, you, as your book has pointed out, is we're looking at something which makes uh, the, the Iraq experience, that makes Teapot Dome look like a small, small beer arrangement in terms of corruption. Question, Jack. And the question is, uh, A, uh, can you control uh, can you control how your how the money is being spent more effectively? Number one, and number two, what's the likelihood of, of, of the USTR solution, uh, and what are the steps to to move toward that direction if if that that's what you want to do? Well, uh, the agencies aren't self-healing on these issues, so I think it's going to take a congressional directive for that to happen. And in any in any event, if you're going to create a new entity, that 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 uh, that probably requires Congress's action. Uh, the, the, thus, the likelihood, given that what about five percent of bills pass, uh, is is about five percent. Uh, but but the, but there's a golden moment now. I think hard lessons serves as the body of evidence to support uh, that verdict. And 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 uh, and but the judges are, are up on Capitol Hill, and that was the part of the purpose of yesterday's hearing. So if it's going to happen, more hearings. Uh, I think they're probably probably in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, or SASC and 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 Homeland Security Government Affairs, wherein their their the members develop an agreement because there was largely at the end of the hearing agreement from those HASC members there uh, of the need for reform. Uh, uh, so uh, we'll, we'll see. I think it's an idea whose time has come. But but what what regardless of whether that's the solution, the problem stands. Uh, as it is, and that's the United States government does not have a management framework in place for the effective execution of overseas contingency operations. Questions? Yes. Right 
Right. No, no, no. <laughs> raffle, raffle it off. Otter even. Quick. <laughs> Walt, Walt Cutler, former Foreign Service. Uh, I'd just like to commend you for the, uh, frankly, the independence and indeed courage uh, you. that you've shown in carrying out your, your duties Thank over you. the past few years. Uh, I was struck by what you mentioned, and that is that there are hundreds of projects in Iraq that we've tried to turn over to the Iraqis, and they didn't want to receive. I wonder if you could expand on that, what kinds of projects, uh, why the reluctance, and what this tells us and helps us to learn a hard lesson for uh, Afghanistan. Let's do two questions. Yeah. yeah. Cut. OK. Two sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Ask your second question. Okay. Uh, Doug Brooks with APOA, the um, Association of uh, Stability Contractors. Uh, and looking at the contracting today, it seems to be more along the lines of or government contracting. is more along the lines of vengeance contracting. It's like after the fact, you send in the auditors to see what went wrong. I'm interested in what your points would be in terms of improving the contract management, which would have probably <laughs> done quite a bit to improve the, the larger operation. Right. Good questions. Uh, Ambassador Cutler, the asset transfer uh, audit is our third one coming out uh, in the month, and it will unfortunately say the same thing that our previous two ones said, and that is there is not a, an effective system in place for ensuring that that the United States is going to transfer to Iraqi control. What we built, this is, as I've said before, the, the locus of, I think, perhaps the largest waste that, that, that could unfold in, in Iraq, because if, regardless of how well it's built, if it's turned over and not managed, it's gone soon. That's happened in, in Nazaria. Our most expensive project, the $277 million Nazaria water treatment plant. Beautifully built by floor, by the way. Uh, but the, the tribe in the area demanded that its uh, people be hired to uh, staff that plant. Unfortunately, the tribe was illiterate. Literacy was not important to them. And so these, this illiterate contingent was put in charge. And the thing, you know, when we went down and visited it in December of 2007, having been handed over in September 2007, it was operating at 20 percent. And, and, uh, and the, we, of course, this is an example of, I think, cigarette oversight working. We brought it to the, quickly went straight to Ambassador Crocker and said, this is going on. Uh, I, the, the, the embassy reacted, and it's, it's doing better now. So it's up, it's up over 50 percent now. But, uh, but for the inspection, you know, look, looking at a breakdown, Khan Bani Saad, of course, I think is the, is the poster child for, for bad projects and bad transfer and bad management. It's a prison, well, a prison structure. Never will be used as a prison. Uh, north of Baghdad, 40 minutes north in the desert in Diyala province, a dangerous place. Uh, in 2007 when the contract was terminated, but long before it was terminated, it was a disastrous story. Uh, there was weak oversight, weak, uh, weak contract management, what you were pointing to, Doug, in your question, that G GRD wasn't getting out there, uh, and, and that the subcontractors repeatedly failed, underscoring another problem, the use of cost-plus contracts in, in this environment, which permitted repeated failure to be rewarded with payment. And that's contrary to basic economic instincts and created appropriate taxpayer outrage, as these various reports repeated. $40 million lost in Khan Bani Saad, a half-finished prison that, that uh, the Iraqis, when we went to give it to them, the deputy minister of justice said, no, no we don't want this. You finish it. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of, of Corps of Engineers projects uh, have also been unilaterally transferred because the Iraqis don't want them, some water, water plants that they don't want. But, or, but chiefly, I think a lot of them, we call them completed, but they were de-scoped and not quite complete. And they look at them and they don't want them. OK. Yes, sir, in the back. Bear McConnell. Um, Rick Barton asked me to, or made me raise my hand for Bosnia and Afghanistan and Iraq. I was waiting for you to call on us for Louisiana. <laughs> um, That's a good, good point. Seems to me Katrina was stability operations. You're right. Seems to me many of the issues you raise are every bit as applicable domestically. They are. They I are. wonder if you'd comment. Well, you're exactly right. And actually, uh, shortly after Katrina is, is $112 billion, by the way, tw more than twice the Iraq enterprise was, was appropriated for Katrina. 
uh, Senator Collins sought to, to expand our mandate to, to, to be the Special Inspector General for the Katrina funds, and that was, that was uh, uh, prevented. Uh, and Not adopted. Yeah, it was prevented. That's all we need to say. And, uh, uh, but it's unfortunate that it was prevented because, uh, there, interestingly, there was a Special Inspector General for Katrina created within the Department of Homeland Security but I don't, you've never heard of anything coming out of that, I guess, for whatever reason. But the uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the reviews that I saw on it uh, didn't evidence much about what happened. The 112 million. I, I did note that into the second year of Katrina, over still over half the contracts were sole source. The, the Katrina recovery program. But you're exactly right. It was the same. A lot of the same players doing rebuilding down there. And and a lot of the same contracting problems, and uh, uh, you know, there's there are lessons to be learned uh, from Iraq that are applicable uh, to domestic disaster situations as well and recovery. Okay. Last question, Dr. Casells. Oh. Wait, wait for the mic. Wait for the mic. Thanks, Ray. Ward Casells, Assistant right. Secretary of nice Health. All of the lessons that you have given in your book are applicable to the problems we've had rebuilding healthcare infrastructure in Iraq and Afghanistan. Do you have anything more specific that you could tell us? Uh, we're here, open for advice. Uh, we're working, uh, General Petraeus and I, closely to try to rebuild our, to, re to Revise our strategy on Afghanistan healthcare reconstruction. Yes, I do. Use of health as a tool of peace and so forth. And uh, we are we welcome your insights. Well, it, and and I do. We are actually putting out another report, a follow-up report this quarter on the primary healthcare program, clinic program in in Iraq. I mean, it just probably is a program uh, the biggest shortfall. It just it it did it Parsons again failed uh, to carry it out. And we, we finished uh, 100 and, depending on how you count them, 120, 130 of those in follow-on contracts, direct contracts with Iraqis. Uh, but, but it was the wrong way to do it. Uh, the design-build approach, of course, is, is, is now obvious to all, uh, the wrong way to build, especially healthcare clinics, which are, you know, the, there's not a lot of ex sophisticated technical expertise required to build the same building over and over again that you already know what, what it is. It's a, it's a small clinic. It's the equipment, which, by the way, as we visited them, our latest inspectors, so they're not using the equipment. It's, they're not plugged in. They don't know how to use it. They can't find the manual whatever. Uh, but, but how does that apply to Afghanistan? Where it has worked at a much cheaper cost uh, is using CERT money. I mean, this, this is the other thing. The, 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 the using design build made those health clinics cost more than twice what CERT paid. Uh, to build the same clinic, so I think I think it's a it's a useful expenditure of CERP money in Afghanistan to build health clinics. Uh, the, the, as I said, the other challenge is ensuring that they're properly equipped, and the and those that are in there know how to use it. So as you as you as you develop the CERP uh, program, if you're going to use it for health clinics, be sure there's a training components to the contract as well. That it, that's, so the contract's not done till all the equipment is installed and being operated by Afghans who will use it. We've, we've been over and over again to hospital and clinics across Iraq, you know, and, and there's the, there's the, uh, the uh, disinfectant system, the oxygen system, whatever system, the dental chairs, just sitting over in the corner, unconnected, unused, uh, and they're just using a, a roof and walls, you know, to administer, uh, you know, curbside medical care. And, and so the sophisticated improvements that we sought to bring through the program uh, are ineffectual uh, and lost. Thank you. Um, I wanted to give General Fields an opportunity if you wanted to make any comment or statement, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Um, first, uh, I and my colleagues are here to learn. Uh, we appreciate uh, hard lessons and we wish not that they uh, be replicated uh, in Afghanistan. Um, I am working with Mr. Boyne and members of his staff to help ensure that. I appreciate, Ted, the opportunity yesterday to appear before the House Armed Services Committee. 
along with uh, Mr. Boyne and um, a senior representative from GAO. We will continue to do what we're doing to uh, help uh, rise above the issues that Mr. Boyne uh, points out today and certainly that he has uh, codified uh, in his book, uh, Hard Lessons. And so that's our quest at this time. Thank you very much, sir, for having put together this forum this morning. Thank you, General Fields. Um, in conclusion, I note on Hard Lessons' last page in the afterword, uh, what Secretary of Defense Bob Gates said uh, recently, quote, in recent years, the lines separating war, peace, diplomacy, and development have become more blurred and no longer fit the organizational charts of the 20th century. I must confess to you, as I have said to Stuart, and he knows because he sat in the room as I negotiated the establishment of his office with OMB and State, I did not think at that point that the Special Inspector General for Iraqi Reconstruction would still be in existence today. Nor did I. <laughs> uh, because I thought, quite frankly, that the DOD IG, the State Department IG, USAID IG, uh, should take advantage of what the SIGR was going to do and then embed those lessons into their own respective IG operations. What I think we all have learned is that single departmental focuses and cultures prevent a cross-disciplinary, cross-departmental view of the holistic picture and what is really going on locally with respect to the host government, with respect to the relationship between the military and the civilian structure, within the civilian structure, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to personally thank Stuart for, and there was not an entire acceptance that this <laughs> book should be written, I might add, for those of you who remember some of the comments made in the, in the media. Uh, however, this book, I think, will become, is a text, and will and should be read uh, for the future. Uh, we all stand ready, General Fields, to help you in whatever way we possibly can, and perhaps a year or two or three, you'll be up here and we'll be discussing your hard lessons. So again, thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.